Well, hello and welcome to the Michael Harding Podcast. It's an extraordinary day here in the hills above Loch Allen. It's so warm. I was sitting outside in the garden this morning at ten o'clock, drinking me coffee. The Lord save us. It's just amazing weather. And the the leaves are turning. A little bit of yellow coming. And what'll I tell you, the rose hips, big juicy things the size of tomatoes, small tomatoes. And they're growing there on the wild roses outside my door. And I suppose I'm a bit regretful that I didn't pick them up, gather them up and do something with them, make them into some sort of gel because it's supposed to be very nutritious, the rose hip. Well, I left them and now they've turned, you know, so they're withering and a lot of them are gone. And that doesn't make me too unhappy. I mean, I regret that I didn't do it, but really what I like is the knowledge that the food is there for the birds and for whatever other animals would eat it. It's the same with the black currants. All the fruits that come, even the even the apples, you know, they fall from the tree now and I don't be able to pick up them all, but I feel they're there for whoever needs them. There's another great joy I have at this time of year, to be honest with you, and that's butterflies. Somebody told me one time that if you don't collect the leaves that fall from the trees, it's a very good thing because it's underneath those leaves that you get a lot of little animals. And so I don't. And now I do see loads of butterflies in the garden this time of year. And I feel that the whole environment, if you like, of the trees, the native trees in the little woodland, has created its own biodiversity, as they say nowadays. And it gives me great serenity. It gives me great peace. Like, when I I look at a cat, for example, I like the relationship with the cat because the cat is always kind of feral. Now, there was a cat came here at the start of the summer and we called him Jack. He was a stranger. But his whole back, side and legs were dead. They were like a sack of bones that he was dragging behind him. And it was heartbreaking to see it. And you'd wonder, should we take him to the vet and get him put down, or should... There would be terrible things would come into my mind. Now, I would never do them, but I felt that he was in such pain and suffering that you'd have to try and put him out of his pain. You know, give him... I had tablets, sort of painkillers for, for nerve damage, and you'd be thinking maybe give him an overdose and knock him out. Or bring him to the vet. And we decided to mind him. And to be fair, it wasn't me. There's other more compassionate people in the house than me. And they fed him the best of food all summer. And made a little box for him to stay in. Under the wild rose trees that I'm talking about. And I cannot believe the miracle. But that cat now is walking with a limp. And that limp may even improve over the next six months. But in fact, 90% of the damage that was done to his back and his legs, whatever it was, I presume it was a car hit him, 90% of it is healed. And I find it extraordinary how the feral animal has an ability it's almost like you know the will to live the will to transform yourself is an extraordinary thing and it's there in the animals 
It's one of the things they teach us. And there was one photograph I took during the summer, about three weeks ago. It was of a fox. He was crossing the road. And he looked at me. As I was taking the photograph, he looked straight at the camera, straight towards me. And I look at that picture of a sentient being who's watching me, who's complex in his evolutionary stage, you know, like, like the life of a fox is a complicated thing. The physiology, the biology of a fox is, is quite an advanced part of or natural evolution. So it's, it's like, God, it's amazing to look at a wild animal. And to look at a wild animal in the eye. And to feel that that wild animal is looking at you. And you know where I'm going with this. It's like the presence that you experience from that animal. The presence you experience from from bees. Who might be floating in the sky there and wiggling their arses. And, you know, communicating with each other about the direction of where there's good pollen. All that sort of stuff is like you're encountering another presence. When you look into the eyes of a wild fox, you are really encountering the wilderness. And you're encountering the wilderness as another presence. And, of course, because they're living in the present moment, totally, their experience of presence is not distracted by the complexity of remembering or anticipating a future. They are right there with you in that present. And that's the eternal present. And if there's one difference I have come to kind of feel, it is that in, in nearly all other, well, I won't say it like that, but in many religious traditions, I suppose particularly I'm talking about Buddhism, that mindfulness and encounter with awakened or enlightened mind is never a personal encounter. But in Christianity, in Islam, in Judaism, it is a, a very personal encounter. And that's what marks them out. You know, it marks out the whole tradition of those three religions. They're all involved in the idea that there is one God behind every mask, every face of God, every tradition of God. It is the one transcendent presence. But that presence reveals itself to us as personhood, like another person. And so encounters with the fox bring me close to that. And encounters with the lovely little cat, Jack, with the bad legs and the dead, the whole deadness of the back was... Oh, it was terrible to see him on a wet day and the, the backside of him slithering around the yard. Shocking. And he's out there now and the four feet are working fairly good. Certainly as good as mine. And he's enjoying himself in the sun and he's got used to the food that is presented to him twice a day. In fact, he does come looking for it and sits there at the corner just outside my window looking around. He doesn't look at me because he knows I don't give him food. But the one who feeds him, she comes. And he waits for her. And it's beautiful to see it. And that's, you know, you can't control the wilderness. There's another thing. You can't control God. But you can't control the wilderness. I think I often see this in simple things like where the cat goes to do its toilet. I find it remarkable that my cat, our cats, I shouldn't even say my cats because 
Who's to say that they, I don't own them? They are, they are cats who live here with us. But they are so clean. They come into the house at night. They sleep in the scullery. They go off hunting sometimes. They come back and sleep on the couch all day sometimes. They lounge around like lions on the patio. And yet they're completely clean. You feed them, yes. But sometimes when you go away for a few days or a week, they don't seem to have any bother because they go out hunting and they get a mouse. And they sleep in the sheds because there's big sheds close to us for hay. And I'd say there's a queer amount of mice down there too. So they live their own individual life. And every morning, one of them, Peabody, Peabody goes down a particular laneway in the garden. And he's going to do his morning dump. And he's as regular as a clock. And he goes to the same area. Not in the same just exact spot, but in an area. And covers it up. And it's as healthy. It's just remarkable what animals do. Out there in the wild. Keeping themselves clean. Look at the fox. The fox I, I met and took a photograph of him. And his, his fur is so clean. Nobody washed him. He washed himself. Or herself. I actually think that fox was a vixen. But I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe write in the comments if anybody knows how to determine whether a fox is male or female, let me know. And I'll put up the picture of the fox and tag it into this podcast. So I, that's not obviously what I wanted to talk about and share with you today, but I oh God, I just couldn't resist it, you know. Um, one of the things I wanted to do, I suppose, was, and you might find this strange, but I wanted to talk about Burr. Burr is a town in Offaly. And I like Burr as a town. Well, let me tell you about it. I was at a festival in Burr about ten years ago, and I was reading back on my notes, and I thought, you know, I, I kind of fell in love with it as a town. It's, there's Borr Castle. I did a one-man show in it about Jonathan Swift. And Jonathan Swift was out of the 18th century. And Lord Ross came to it with his lady wife. And they dressed up in period costume. And they were sitting in the front row. And they were, they were better dressed than John, my Jonathan Swift. But we had a great night, and there was another time I went back for this particular festival I'm talking about, and I was sitting in the courtyard cafe of the castle. The castle has, you know, in in, in places that have been turned in, opened up for the public, you'll, you'll usually have a cafe in the courtyard, or somewhere in an outhouse. And I was there sitting, admiring, there was a harp, a wooden harp, it, it was carved like it was an art piece, it was by some German fellow called um, oh, Werner Grohl. And the, there was a little CV of him. You know, he grew up in a forest in Germany, it said, where the peasants were allowed to cut down old trees each year for fuel. And he grew up to love old wood. So all his life as a sculptor, that's the kind of stuff he did. And, and Bohr was hosting his work so that all around the town there were different figures and and sculptures by him and uh, that was lovely enjoyed that and the harp brings me back you see to Torlock O'Carolan and the 18th century and Jonathan Swift and then I'm sitting at these outdoor tables and it's a lovely day and I'm having Earl Grey tea it's not I'd normally just have you know can I have a tea but I asked for Earl Grey tea because it was on the menu and also because I associate Earl Grey tea with all things posh. It's it's just part of what I'd imagine Anglo-Irish culture, you know, having Earl Grey tea, not not just Barry's tea all the time, but Earl Grey tea sounds very good, you know. 
And it, it Earl Grey tea is different. It is a beautiful light texture to it. And it's very, very good in the afternoon. So what people used to do, as far as I know, in the big houses in the great Anglo-Irish culture, they'd be having a very strong cup of tea in the morning. Assam tea, maybe. But a strong cup. And then in the afternoon, the ladies might have Earl Grey tea. It wouldn't be too strong. And I had my Earl Grey tea and I had a, a cake with it. A lovely sandwich of cream and jam between two soft cushions of sponge. And yes, it was a Victoria cake. Named apparently after Queen Victoria, who used to like her afternoon tea and she took a liking to cake in the years after her beloved Albert died. So there I am, and I'm eating the old Victoria sponge, thinking of the Queen of England, who in the 19th century lost her dear husband and partner. And at the other tables, people were nibbling away at chocolate buns and salad sandwiches. This is ten years ago, so I still was a bit prejudiced against salad sandwiches. I had no respect for people who ate salad. And if there was one thing that would darken my face was somebody saying, what would you like? Would you like a salad? Now, after all sorts of illnesses and heart attacks, I have more respect for the salad than I used to have. I know now there's great nourishment in it and it doesn't do any damage. In fact, it's good for your heart and good for your whole, you know, blood pressure and this, that and the other. So these are the things you learn as you get older. Now, there was an old man, actually, in this moment when I was sitting there at the outdoor tables with Miss sponge, an old man, and he had a tattered red baseball cap. Nothing to do now with Trump. Nothing to do with making... Bore great again. This is long before Trump. Long before. Politics were much more settled if you went back there 10 or 12 years. He was sitting there anyway with a red baseball cap and he was trying to mind his granddaughter, an unruly little three year old who kept straining on the leash. She had her eye on the entrance to the toilets probably wondering why so many people were coming and going, in and out. And each time she moved, the old man would shout, No, no, you can't go in there. That's the powder room. As if it might be an arsenal of gunpowder. And I was I was looking at him, staring at him. He caught my eye and he asked me, Where are you from? And I said, Westmeath. Now, that was the truth at the time. I was living in Westmead. I was living in Mullingar. Ah, he said, I suppose the green Peter is hopping on Loch Lane these nights. I'm given that now in a kind of a Cavan accent. And he wasn't talking in a Cavan accent. Down in Bor, he'd be talking more like people talk down there. It's an accent I can't do, so I'm going to avoid it. But I loved the way he said this, like, I suppose the green painter is hopping on Loch Lane these nights. I said, I don't know what you're talking about. And he explained that the green painter is larva that floats up to the surface of lakes in Westmead in the evenings during the summer and hatches on the surface. You can see the little flies shake their wings dry and scuttle across the surface, says he. And the trout go mad for them, says he, though there's not many trout left. And he fell silent. I love the way he said it like the green painter. I hadn't a clue what he was talking about. And then the way he, he just gave me that image, the little flies shake their wings dry as they scuttle across the surface. You wouldn't get it in a poem. 
You know, there's, there's poets writing now and they're writing in cliches. You go back to Seamus Heaney or Derek Mann or, you know, beautiful turn of phrase. They can carve out a phrase like a wood turn or carving, carving a bit of wood. You read modern poets, more recent poets, and you can get bogged down in an awful lot of cliches, to be honest. Anyway, I'm I'm reflecting on this lovely time I had down in Bor, and I had me sponge cake and I had me conversation with the old lad, and then oh, there was there was loads of things to do and loads of places to go, and I was looking at the whole program for the festival. They had vintage tennis, for example. Everything was vintage, so I presume vintage tennis was playing with old fashioned rackets and dressing in old fashioned clothes. And those prizes for the best dressed lady and gent. And then there was a flower festival. There was a night of vintage music. From wild gypsy airs to romantic Neapolitan songs. A parade of vintage cars and vehicles. And horses and hounds. And at the weekend. Do you know what there was at the weekend? There was a ferret display. I wasn't there for it. I just love to know what they were at. Ferrets, do you know the boys? They, they ferret around, so and they go down a hole like they go down holes after rabbits and badgers and things. When we were young, when we were young in Calvin Town, those young lads in the town kept ferrets, and they would go out into Farnham Estate with the ferrets, and they'd have the ferrets sometimes in their pockets, and in bags. And they, they must have been well-tamed ferrets, you know, like pets. And they'd go out hunting with the ferret. I take care of me granddaughter, the old man joked to me when I was with him, and her mammy takes care of me. And there was archery, there was clay shooting, gun dogs, and fly casting competitions. There was everything had a kind of an air of Edwardian grandeur. I headed off uptown along Oxmanton Mall, marvelling at the Georgian buildings. The Georgian buildings in Burr are second to none. That town is gorgeous. It has a real flavour of Victorian, Edwardian, or even go back to Georgian. The old Georgian buildings, they're gorgeous. Stone houses with their wide doors and fanlights and arches that once opened into stable yards. It's an old world that is so completely intact I could almost imagine Edwardian gentlemen taking snuff in the snugs of cosy bars and ladies in frills and frocks promenading along the mall. Lilting little ditties from Gilbert and Sullivan operettas. I suppose I was getting a glimpse of Ireland. A particular glimpse of Ireland. A, a glimpse of Ireland that would be different from Peg Sayers Cottage. Don't get me wrong. I do go up to Donegal and I, I try to learn Irish and I love the Irish writers. But... That's an Ireland that we're used to, do you know, that Catholic and that sort of Celtic Ireland, that native peasant Ireland. And it used to be so summed up in the image of Peg Sayers. But this was a different Ireland. This was a world more real, perhaps, than all the Celtic twaddle of myth and valour and keen in women that infected the Irish imagination 100 years ago and which made the 20th century so stifling in Ireland. All that sense of who we were as kind of just Gaelic, a Gaelic people and a Catholic people, it was stifling, you'd have to admit. Well, well, Burr, you see, when I sat there and walked around the town, I realised... This town has shown me a flavour of a different Ireland. An Edwardian Ireland. A Victorian Ireland. I saw four women in straw hats and long dresses. 
Ladies straight out of the mid-nineteenth century, moving like ghosts along the street. And what a lovely way to have a festival where people dressed up, obviously part of community groups, and they all dressed up in these beautiful... Beautiful because they're nostalgic, do you know what I mean? That they're like, they're drawing you back into the past. There probably is some people nowadays who would say that it is a celebration of colonialism or a celebration of, you know, patriarchy when people were subjected by the ruling classes of the British Empire. But I don't see it like that. I think it's tragic to look at the world like that. I think it's it's more like it's more like using the past to live more intensely in the present. So when you find places in the past that fill you with a kind of nostalgia, fill you with a kind of emotion of like, wasn't it wonderful and beautiful and gentle and and peaceful back then? It, it, it's a really healthy way to create this sort of lens. That's the way it was then, and this is the way it is now. And what happens then is that your your experience of yourself in the present moment becomes more intense. It's just a paradox, but Garcia Marcus goes on about this too. It's a paradox that the more we reflect on the past, the more it actually can bring us into the present. The four women I'm talking about in their long dresses, looking like they were out of the mid-19th century, they were giggling. They were standing at a shop window and looking into it and they were giggling and I got as far as them and I saw it was Edwardian postcards. A whole lot of these, you know, sort of adult, crude Edwardian postcards. And one of the the caption underneath it was, what's the difference between sparrows and worms? And the image was a furious teacher with a big red nose and he was asking the question to a petrified little boy in the classroom. What's the difference between sparrows and worms? And the little sweaty lad replied, I don't know, sir. I never had sparrows. There was a French market in the square for a couple of days. And above the mall and streets, the sky was purple, overcast, heavy, and chestnut trees were ripe with chestnuts. And Virginia creeper spilled over the high walls from gardens I could not glimpse. Everything tried to be old, and everything old was beautiful. I saw an exhibition of photographs, self-portraits by people with intellectual disability who were also growing old. And this was wonderful. This was the moment that really made it for me. Self-portraits. People with intellectual disability. Growing old. And in one photograph, a woman sat at her lace curtain window. And beside it, she wrote, I am 57 years old. I live here in St. Joseph's Unit. I share my living area with 23 other ladies, some of whom have become my friends. I used to go home for my summer holidays, but Mammy is not well any more. I thought that was heartbreaking. On St John's Mall... The third Earl of Ross smiled at me from his plinth. A man who in 1845 saw more clearly and further than any other man in history because he had invented and built a telescope that year. He could not have seen the future in time, the famine that was coming like two, three years later. He could not have anticipated that 70 years later, when he was an old man, his own grandchild would be dragged to an early grave. 
in the World War. He could not have anticipated the troubles in Dublin in 1916 and the Free State of 1922 that was to change all that vintage world forever and put an end to postcard humour. That was all kind of forgotten, if you like, in 1922. From 1922 to, to 2022, there was a trajectory which part of it was kind of creating the new state but also being forgetful about the Edwardian world, the Victorian world, and how huge and important that was, and how it mattered to people in ordinary little towns and villages up and down the country. I think that's what I like about the Vintage Festival in Bar, and I don't even know if they're still doing it. I hope they are. I mean, they probably didn't do it during COVID, but I hope they're, I hope they're still doing it. It's, it's more and more unpopular to do something like that. If you notice, for example, on Netflix or on other stations, Downton Abbey as a program stands out. And it's a kind of program of reflective nostalgia. But it's the only one, or it's certainly one of the rare ones. 30 years ago, I remember, there was a company called Merchant Ivory, and they were making so many nostalgic films from books about Edwardian life or life in India under the British or whatever. And they were like, they were beautiful films. And I think that they brought, to me anyway, a, a huge sense of nostalgia. And I think that that's missing now. Because I think that the interpretation that that we're putting on history now is one that examines how people were oppressed. So if you're looking at how people were oppressed by, let's say, British colonialism, it becomes less fashionable to celebrate the beauty of Edwardian culture or Victorian culture or Georgian culture. And the more we become affirmative about our national identity in Ireland, particularly after Brexit, the less likely it is that we kind of celebrate that aspect of Irish life all across the island, from Belfast right down to, to Killarney, that aspect of our life that is British, that where the architecture is British, the town planning is British. The thing, the railways, everything that happened under what you'd call the British system, we're not as nostalgic about it because we've become, I think, more critical of history. And that's fair enough, but I do miss, I do miss the nostalgia, and I'll tell you why. Nostalgia, looking back, reflective nostalgia, is a way of looking at the past and saying, that's the way we were. And it allows you to wake up more fully in the present. You can try it, for example, if you look at old photographs. And it's a thing, I I wonder do people do as much of that as they used to. It's almost because photographs are now so available. You know, you can take photographs with your telephone. It's in your hand all the time. And they're high resolution, they're superb. And so you fill your computer with photographs and they're in some, mine anyway, mine are so inane. They're so empty and vacuous, most of them. I make no effort. I just, you know, snap things. But then I never look at them because I have so many of them. And I don't cherish them the way I used to cherish photographs of an event where I might have a film and I'd be able to take 24 photographs with that film so I just have 24 photographs and I would get them developed and then I'd put them in a little album and I find myself still looking back I have I have a photograph photographic album of my wedding my ordination 
and other events when I was young. And I open the yellow pages and I look at the yellowing photographs and I look at myself and I think, oh my God, I was a child. And then I look further and I say, God, I was very thin. I've, I've become very fat. But yet there's a strange sense that I recognize that's where I was then. It opens up the present moment to me in a very, very beautiful way. It's also a thing I feel that it works lovely with people who are old. Now, I am 70, so I consider myself old now. But I know that if you're talking to somebody who's, let's say, 80 years of age, and you open an old album with them, I used to do it with my mother sometimes. I would have, I would pick a particular photograph out of an old album. A nice one, you know, one where it compliments her. So there were images of her when she worked in Cork, way, way back, maybe in the 30s or 40s, I don't know. And there would be, you know, maybe her in a very swanky coat walking down Patrick Street in Cork. And there I'd get that photograph and I'd bring it. So I'd be sitting with her and she'd have gone into her own narrow little world, as we all do the older we get. And I would show her the picture and she'd smile and she'd she'd think, oh my goodness, yeah, oh, that was me. And you'd see her really examining who she was back then. And when she let go of that nostalgia, when she kind of gave me, handed me the photograph back and, and we just sat there and I looked at her, I could see in her eyes a sense of awakening to the present moment. That was me then. And this is me now. I am awakening to who I am in this moment. So it works for old people and it works for me. And I think we do less of it because, as I say, the photographs are too available. So we don't cherish them as much. But that's what that's why I wanted to talk about Bor. I loved it as a town. It's ten years ago. I hope the vintage festival is still going on down there. And I suppose I hope that we continue, especially if we're going towards, as the Taoiseach or somebody was saying yesterday on the radio, they, you know, they think that we're all moving towards a united island. Well, that really will be constituted very differently from the 26 county state because it will have to be a very equal and fair balance between the culture that is Catholic and kind of natively Gaelic and the culture that you would fairly and rightly call British. And there were some just super duper beautiful things about it. I always remember when I'd go to Castle Pollard as a child and we would be visiting a house where my mother's, do you know, my mother's father, my mother's grandmother lived in it. And it was a public house. There was a bar downstairs. And then upstairs, the the room that would be facing out onto the street, above the bar, that was the kind of drawing room called the parlour or the drawing room. A hundred, hundred and fifty years ago. And it was virtually intact in the same way when I would have been a child going up into that room. It was precious. The door was rarely opened. There was a round, beautiful mahogany round table at the centre. There was a piano. So many of those rooms had an upright piano because that was their music. They might have even a music stand, like a... It was like a drawer, it was like a a cabinet with drawers in it. And you pull the drawer out and it it can hold music sheets. So you'd have the music for operas or Gilbert and Sullivan or songs by Thomas Moore or something. And a party would be sitting around, standing around the piano and somebody would be able to play and they'd, they'd all sing together the songs. 
And that room would be quiet and, and kind of almost mournful. You know, lace curtains holding the sun back. A kind of a, a real restraint that made me feel when I went into it as a child. I was very, very close to Queen Victoria. Or she might as well have been sitting in the rocking chair. And yes, there was a rocking chair. There was rocking chairs everywhere. I felt close to Queen Victoria without knowing I was close to her. But when I look back, I think that must have been the atmosphere I was getting. It was a very matriarchal atmosphere. And the word they had for that room, you know, the drawing room, I used to think it was about drawing. The people were going in, you know, with, with sketchbooks drawn. But as far as I know, that that word came from the idea that when you'd be at the dinner table, everybody would be there, male and female. And then when it came to the coffee, the ladies would withdraw. So it was the withdrawing room. The drawing room. Now again, I might be wrong about that. So if anybody knows better, please give me a note in the, in the comment section. And the other word they had for it was the parlour. And, well, obviously that's from parlay, you know, to talk. The parlour. The parliament. The place you go to talk. But I loved the shadows in that room in Castle Pollard. I loved the quiet grandeur of it. And I loved growing up in Cavan and experiencing it in a very intimate and, and close way the the kind of remnant of British culture that permeated every aspect of life in the town of Calvin at that time. And we don't really acknowledge it much. Now, I'm not doing this, I'm not talking like this for political reasons. I have no politics. I have no politics. My politics, as you know, are the incarnation. My politics, you know, I am neither male nor female, Greek nor Jew, but in Christ, one as a brother to all the brothers and sisters of the world. I am made new in Christ. That's what I believe. And I don't, I don't believe when I say that about Christ. I don't believe I'm talking about a ghost in the sky. I'm simply talking about my perception of the reality that I'm engaged with. So so somebody might be engaged with the same reality as I am at this moment, and I'm looking out on those, as I said at the beginning, those rose hips on the beautiful wild roses that grow outside. And the little cat, he's gone now, Jack. I don't know where he's gone. He's down the garden sunning himself somewhere. But I look out on that, or I think about the fox that I met and took a photograph of, Somebody else might look at that with a scientific view, and their view would be correct. And they would have a scientific understanding of what is the nature of that fox, or how that fox has evolved as a species, or you know, what's the nature of those rose hips, or what they can be useful for. How much vitamin C can you get from them? Somebody could have all those knowledges about the world around them, the world in front of them and I might not have them but but what I see I feel is all, also true and that is that I'm engaging with that world initially as wilderness, as wildness as, as something that is not it's not living with my stamp upon it it's living freely like a bird like a bird that sits on a branch, freely this, and it's so it's coming towards me. It is, it is presenting itself to me. And what I experience in that presentation is personhood, personhood. So I'm experiencing Christ coming towards me, N not as a ghost, no. I'm looking at the same thing as 
as the scientist, as Richard Dawkins, whoever is looking at. And I'm appreciating the truth of their position in relation to the science and the knowing. But there is a different kind of knowing, a knowing that is love. Love is that different kind of knowing that is in the heart. And for me, that's the ground of all consciousness. Not the isolation of self, but actually the rapture with the other. The otherness, real presence, coming at me in everything. And again, when I use the word Christ, I'm not talking about the historical Jesus in that Jesus who became the Christ, who was transformed into a deeper ontological reality, a cosmic reality, that because of the event of the birth and death and resurrection of Jesus, you have this sense that the cosmos is ontologically changed. And now I can experience the roses outside the door as the fingerprint of God. God has has moved into the cosmos. The cosmos groans and evolves and evolution is one way to see it, but but revelation, the process of what within is pushing itself out towards me, is another way of seeing it. So I'm no longer engaged with with the world about me in a mechanical or even scientific or even philosophical way, and I'm certainly not dealing with it based on the destructive concept of nihilism as it has manifested in the West over 200 years. No. I'm engaging with it as with the beloved, as with, as with the sacred other who comes to me and is a person. Now that's that's enough of that for today. Because I, I was trying in this particularly beautiful day. This this oh God, I hope you're having a really good day. I hope you're having a really good weekend. And I hope we have a good autumn. I'm looking forward to the process of reflecting on loads of different things as we go through autumn. And the light begins to fade and then we go down into winter. I'm looking forward to that. But but on this particular day in the hills above Loch Allen, my goodness, it is paradiso. And and no amount of scientific understanding of evolution would would suffice my heart. My heart responds to this moment and in this moment as if I had engaged with the divinity. God is everywhere. There is nothing but God. That's what they say in Islam. Look at what Patrick said. Look at what Patrick said. Fourth century. Christ behind me, before me, beside me, above me, below me. He wasn't talking about some sort of floating ghost spinning around him. He was looking at the the bushes, the tree the sky and he was recognising it for what it is Christ have a great weekend bye bye